welcome to the Children's Book Author Podcast. I'm your host, Eleanor Page. If you write for children, or it's always been your dream to, you're in the right place. As the children's book author, I'm on a quest to discover everything there is about writing, publishing, and marketing children's books, as well as how to supercharge my creativity, skyrocket my productivity, and absolutely everything else there is to know about how to be the best, so you can be too. Join me as I interview fabulous guests and become the children's book author. Welcome back to the Children's Book Author Podcast with me, your host, Eleanor Page. Today we're up to episode 13 with Tom Froze, an award-winning illustrator, teacher, and speaker. He's also writing, so he's a writer too. And even though I did record this episode back when the podcast was still the creative genius at play, in fact... I recorded this podcast episode probably about a year ago now and have been sitting on it and I just listened back over it as I was editing it and yes, I am learning how to draw. So if you are learning also how to draw and there's lots of children's book authors that are learning how to draw, you will find this incredibly, incredibly valuable. But even if you are just a children's book writer, as you listen through, I encourage you to, to hear everything he says from a writer's perspective. Here are some of the key things that really popped out to me and I paused as I was listening to the podcast and went and did. We talk a lot about discovering your style or creative identity. I paused as I was listening to the podcast and I thought, what are some key words that people say when they leave me reviews that give me clues to my style? And I'm going to read you the list because I actually found it quite insightful and I hadn't done this exercise. Perhaps if you've already published something or even if you've written something, give it to someone to read. Ask them to give you some feedback and notice what words they say. So I actually went onto Amazon and looked at my Amazon reviews, and these are some of the words that kept coming up. Fun, exciting, funny, fast-paced, quirky characters full of personality, talking animals, magical, valuable lesson, good versus evil, lots of action, fantasy, otherworldly, and twists at the end. So there's a lot of keywords in there that start to show me my style. And I hadn't really ever done this exercise until I re-listened to this interview with Tom. And yes, he is talking from an illustration perspective, but so many of the things that he talks about can really be applicable to the art of writing. The other thing I loved that Tom mentioned was, you know, practicing being you and doing this through uh, noticing who inspires you, who else inspires you. Of course, as an artist, you would be looking at other people's art, but as an author, you would be reading other people's children's books and then imitating that initially and then innovating by doing, you know, your own version of something different. So some people have said to me when it comes to The Magician's Convention, which was my first middle grade novel, that it's kind of Harry Potter-like. It's not the same at all, but there's elements of Harry Potter. And I think that's because that inspired me and I was sort of imitating it and then innovating. And it was my very first novel. So as I've ne then written the next novel, I get a little bit less imitation and more innovation. Well, I like to think so. But that was a really valid point that Tom brought up that I think you'll love to listen to. And Tom talked a bit about when finding your style, particularly as an illustrator, deciding what brushes and colors you want to use and sticking to them and that that actually gets rid of a lot of anxiety. And again, I could relate as an author because there are, when you're writing in terms of there's a style in terms of what rhetorical devices you use, what chapter length, 
what point of view. Uh, these are some of the things that we get to choose in terms of our style as writers. And hearing him say that he limits that choice made me notice that actually I think I've unconsciously limited my choices as well. So there's some absolutely brilliant points. I think you're going to love this interview with Tom. I enjoyed it so much and learned so much about being a better writer and creative. I hope you enjoy today's show. Welcome back to the show. Today, I I always say I've got a very special guest, but today's guest is extraordinarily special. He is an award-winning illustrator, teacher, and speaker. He loves making images. I'm not telling you the name yet. He See if you guess. He loves making images that make people happy. In his work, you will experience a flurry of joyful colors, spontaneous textures, and quirky shapes. As a teacher, he loves to inspire fellow creatives to become creatively empowered. He's a top teacher on Skillshare where I discovered him and a passionate voice in the creative industry. Welcome to the show, Tom Frost. Thanks, Elena, for having me. And did I say your surname correctly? You did. You said Froze, right? Yeah. Yeah, you got it. Oh, good, good. I normally check that before I go on air, but, you know, we were having so much fun bantering that I didn't check. So welcome to the show and tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, man. Um, that's so broad. Uh, I think you kind <laughs> That's of... why I like it. It <laughs> depends what you're going to pick. <laughs> yeah, well, you covered my, my sort of career thing. You know, I'm an illustrator, uh, teacher. I kind of came into this profession through being a designer. And before that, I was actually more in kind of tech and computer engineering. And before that, I was a very lackluster high school student. So, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I'm, I'm based in just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia. And, uh, I have two kids and, uh, yeah. So now you work as an illustrator mm -hmm. and, and also as a teacher. And I think of you as kind of, you might not think of yourself this way, but almost like at the top of your game, you know who you are, you have a really strong sense of identity and yourself as a creative. How did you get to that point? Was it always like that? Hmm. That's a very generous assessment. And it's certainly what I'm aiming for in terms of like, I think it's really important for artists and especially illustrators to, to have that sense of identity because our, the, you know, not like our all encompassing identity, but just that artistic identity, because that's our product. That's what, what we get known by and that's what we have to make a living by. So, uh, you know, how I, I came to that is, man, um, you know, I feel like it's my answer is just cliche. It's like putting in the time, working hard at it, reading a lot. Uh, I think I think just studying work that I admire, and yeah, I I I don't I can't really give you like a really quick summary of that one, but but I can say that I think I know I just noticed as I started getting more and more into. Well, first in design, I noticed that the designers that I was most attracted to and admired the most were the ones who weren't just doing any kind of design. Like they weren't like jacks of all trade and doing all kinds of different styles. They had like this real sense of like you could you could look at something by, say, John Contino and all of his work would be different and there'd be lots of variety. But you could also tell it, it, it was John Contino's work. And so it's. It was that that kind of I saw that more and more in illustration. I was like, well, illustration is kind of like the ultimate sense of like someone having that sense of identity or style. And and so the illustrators that I've always admired, um, one of my favorite examples that I always use is Olympia Zanoli. She's an Italian illustrator and her sense of like her identity and her work is so strong. But it's not just that it's her sense of identity, like it's smart and clever and, and beautiful. And so just for whatever reason, I've just had a, that, that taste or whatever, that preference for that kind of identity forward illustration. 
And so I, that's just something that I've, I've, I've tried to pursue myself. Yeah, I definitely feel that in all of your work. It's like I would instantly see something of yours and know it was your work. And I'm so envious of that because I'm like literally like newbie, newbie, newbie when mm. it comes to to drawing. And what I find myself doing is, oh, I should, you know, do a, do a course on Skillshare. So I kind of jump on and it's like today we're drawing a fish. So I'll, you know, draw the fish. And I do pick up skills like in Procreate, but at the end of it, I'm kind of left feeling like, hmm, it's like I drew their style. I didn't really draw my style. Mm. It doesn't feel like necessarily it's me. So when I came across your courses, there were so many things that you said. I was literally like, no, taking, no, taking, no, <laughs> because yeah. there was a really strong sense of do this from the beginning and correct me if I'm wrong, do it from a beginning in a way that really does stay true to who you are as a creative and take some of those creative risks. Oh, there's so many things. How mm, do I even totally, start? Totally. So let's, let's start talking about some of that. Yeah, totally. I think there's kind of two things that I would pick out of what you noticed about what I teach. And the, the first important thing is like when you're beginning, uh, I think imitation is just inevitable and not to really be avoided. I mean, that's how you learn is not worrying about what your voice is and not worrying about, you're not ready for that. If you're at the, at the very beginning, you're inspired. The next logical step is to imitate. And then the next logical step from there is to, of course, innovate. Those are what I call my three eyes, right? Inspiration, imitation, innovation. And um, so there's that. And then the other side of that is also practicing being you. So as you're learning, like kind of learning your craft, learning how to hold a pencil, learning, you know, maybe going to a life drawing class, all of that's like, there's nothing too creative about that. It's really just technique. And then at a certain point, you kind of have to lose the training wheels and try, try being yourself. And, and so that's, that's the other side, I guess, is, is, you know, maybe you don't like the way you draw people, right? Um, you can only really, in my opinion, you can only like, it, it might make you vulnerable. It might be un, kind of awkward to try drawing and i and i think a big thing with that that you i just noticed when i listened to your pilot episode was that you're you have to share what you're making as you're going like i love that about uh your own journey is that you you just like you're you're not shy about showing those the very beginning steps and what that looks like with people you just have to keep making and sharing and i actually think that that's something that a lot of um people who become successful as illustrators have they have this kind of innate, it's like they may be perfectionistic, but their drive to share is greater than that. And so I guess within that, I'm, I'm saying like that you have to include in that, um, you can't always be drawing Mickey Mouse or whatever, I don't know, whatever people imitate or copy, you have to do something original and unique and it starts awkward, but it, it sort of get, you, you shape that as you go along. So it's normal to be feeling quite awkward. Mm -hmm. How long does that last? Or is that something that's with you in some ways all the way through? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd say I, I'm a lot more comfortable in my, in my creative skin now. Like I just, I've kind of figured out like what my, I, I like to call them my mannerisms are in my art. Like I, like there have been like these moments in my trajectory where I'm like, no matter how I draw people, I keep returning to this particular shape of face or whatever. And it's just what comes natural. And I don't want to spend all my time trying to get like a better face. Like this is, this is it. And so big pointy noses or, or, or whatever it is, I just, I'm like, that's, that's what I'm just going to stick with for now on. And there's, a reason for it like there's there's like behind that it's like i'm not i'm not i'm yeah i'm not trying to draw a realistic person 
with like, or even a character, like a, someone in a book that you might, um, they might have a sort of persona and you kind of attach a story to them. Most of the time in my own art, everything's symbolic. If I, if I need to represent like a surfer dude, that's it. That's all I need to do. Give it a bit of personality. It doesn't really matter uh, about other, other nuances, if that makes sense. So can you remind me of the question again, just so I stay on track for this answer? Uh, just the awkwardness, you know, like uh, that initial awkwardness. And yeah. you said that, if, you know, now you don't have it as much because yes. you feel like you've, yeah. Then you, uh, but that's a really great point, what you were saying. That and it leads into my next question mm. that you've gotten so comfortable with your way of doing certain things and and you recognize that some of those are symbolic, but you're like, that's that's my style. That's that's how I like to do it. Mm. So let's talk a bit about people finding their style. You know it is the most common question is, yeah. that is ever asked, how do I find my style? And uh, you know, some people, like you said, I, I see a lot of people online that don't care about finding a style. Mm -hmm. It is in the tagline of the show yeah. because I think really being yourself and letting your true creative flourishes and actually picking a style, mm -hmm. I think that's very innovative. That some innovation comes from eventually doing that. So how, why is style important and how do we find it eventually? One right. day, why is, is it like 10 years? <laughs> is it yeah. a 10 year thing? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think you might expect this answer, but there's no timeline for, for finding your style, right? It's, um, and, and I don't know if it's, maybe sometimes the question is, is not worded in a way that matches the reality. Like you don't necessarily find your style, your style kind of meets you halfway, right? Like you're doing, you're trying to do stuff that you're inspired by and you're finding it's not quite working and and meanwhile, you're, you're sort of finding you're, you're doing something. And if you're paying attention and you're working hard at it and, uh, looking up close, standing far back and, and process, just always analyzing and observing what you're, what you're, what's coming out of you. I think, I think in there, you'll find something, you'll know yourself through that. And, and. And so I don't, I don't know how long that takes and I don't know if it takes any special skill. I think like, I think there's, uh, it, it seems so shrouded in mystery. I think you look at, uh, uh, you know, pick your favorite artist who has a very distinct style and it feels like almost like they were born with it. It's like, like they just, they just must come to the, the, you know, Adobe Illustrator or their sketchbook or whatever and just this stuff kind of flows out of them magically because they're they're a very talented uber human and i i actually don't th i think that's just a like just, it appears that way but i don't think it's 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 true i think i think there's if you look at if you follow the the like the, let's just say like if you look at uh, someone's body of work from 10 years ago to now if they've been working that long, you'll notice an awkward beginning. They like, you might, I think uh, awkward when you compare it to their later, um, their later work. And I actually did this exercise when I was creating my uh, class on Skillshare, it's called the style class. And, and yeah, I was trying to, I had this theory that everyone starts off with a more hand influenced style and then as they develop and hone, hone their techniques they get um more refined and and their visual language becomes solidified it crystallizes into this thing that you perceive um on the other on, on the other side you perceive that as like this glorious strong identity and yeah i think it, it's just like that story it always starts with the techniques you have uh, I, I know I'm kind of going the, about this answer in a roundabout way, like the importance of style, but um, style kind of comes as you chip away at it. And, and I think it's just about paying attention and, and homing, honing your technique. And for me, it's been a huge part in just understanding the, 
you know, the role of style in pro uh, solving problems. Like for me, I see all creative things as problem solving uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in the sense that like, I'm not just creating visual stuff. Like it's not just to look at. And as an artist, I have no ideas unless I'm, I have some kind of prompt and then I need to solve the problem. So I'm kind of <laughs> right back here, but style is a uh, problem solving tool and we can d dig deeper into that if you want. But style's really important. And this is the thing that, this is like my, my beef with a lot of illustration, um, maybe dialogue or podcasts even. Uh, a lot of people will talk about how style, they don't care about style, like you said, about how style isn't important. And that concept is king. You hear that all the time. And I actually think that that comes from a place of, Maybe not for everyone, but I think for some people it comes from a place of resentment for the artists who do have a style and that they can market that. And and that's certainly like I, I, I know where that kind of feeling came from for me. And, and and I think I think you can't you can't avoid the fact that style is important. Like everyone asks that question when they're new. And then a lot of people will determine through their own journey that style the way they thought of it isn't important to them. And that's totally a valid thing. A lot of people want to have multiple styles, but still, whether you have multiple or one style, the question of style is going to be um, what your client's wondering about, what style will this end up in? And if you don't have a predictable, reliable style to work in, you're going to do a lot of, um, you're going to go through a lot of revisions <laughs> with a lot of clients and it's going to be a big headache. So, um, I mean, that's just one of many reasons that to, 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 to hold style in, in a high regard. So, yeah, well, I have taken that class. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm up to the part where I had to pick my inspirations and put together, you know, collages based on who inspired me. And mm -hmm. it's taken me a couple of weeks to do that because, but it was such a great exercise because it made me, re I didn't realize who I would pick. I was so busy collecting like what, particularly because I'm all about children's books. Mm -hmm. And I was so busy collecting, you know, middle grade covers, middle grade book covers or kind of those sort of illustrations. But I didn't think which ones do I actually like hmm. or aspire to or look up to or think are amazing or would love to be influenced by until I did that exercise. And it was a bit mind blowing, I've got to tell you. Really? Because, I, I, yeah, I actually discovered that more about myself from doing that exercise than even from drawing to some right? extent. Huh. Be yeah, because like actually just having to pick who, what did I like showed me, it was almost like a mirror reflection of, now I won't turn out to be exactly like those people. First of all, I may never develop the skill that some of them had, but it showed me certain things like that I love pattern, that I love really bright color, that I love shapes, which I would not have identified had I not done hmm. that. Ex I know I went on a tangent worse than you just said because I was like just so inspired by that class. Yeah. But it's it, coming back to what you said about ultimately it's about problem solving. Mm -hmm. and, and problem solving while being expressive, I think, because, you know, like if you problem solved something, it might be very different than if I problem solved it. So mm -hmm. your expression's in there. But you actually, you know, you go so far as to say, you know, pick certain colors that you might use, pick certain, you know, what else is so many things, mm -hmm. but so that when you sit down to solve the problem and you refer to it a little bit before, you don't have to decide how to draw a face. You know how you like to draw faces and that you like pointy noses and that you're going to stick to that style mm -hmm. and those rules that you've created for yourself to solve that problem. So having a style can be actually really practical Absolutely. when it comes to your day-to-day -day work, right? That's what it's about. And I think, I mean, what you're touching on is the sense that um, if you're the kind of, I have these two kinds of illustrators. I have like the more identity forward, what I call the artist type illustrator, and then the more kind of concept forward or the, um, the designer type illustrator. And so the artist type is more identity forward. Everything they do is going to be very similar. Uh, hopefully not 
like totally boring every time. It's not like they're a one one trick pony. It's just that they have their style buttoned down and that's their they can really focus on like using their style to solve problems from there. Whereas you have the designer type who might just be more flexible and adaptable and and have a sort of a broader range of stylistic approaches. And maybe sometimes they like the challenge of just like trying something totally new every time. And and I think the as a, in terms of problem solving, if you have that button down style or a palette of styles, like a range of these uh, certain ways that you do, maybe you do like ones like a very, I don't know, like vector shape based style. And maybe another is like very like organic and ink lines or something like that. Maybe those are your two go to styles. I know Melinda Beck, for instance, has like two or three distinct styles that she categorizes her work in and sells like promotes herself through on her website and and so some people do that and anyway the the point being is that um this the question of style has already been determined and you can focus on the 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 rest of the 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 illustration problem which will be like what's the idea or like how's this gonna sell whatever on a package or or whatever you're illustrating i think if you're known for your style, it's just one less uh, decision or big question mark that that's going to create some tension between you and your job and your client. Do people resist the you have to pick a, a palette of colors advice? <laughs> do you know, like I often wonder to people like what, like choose certain palette of colors. Can I just change every time? You know, like we buy these, or I have, mm. I bought these like 50,000 swatches on Procreate. Yeah. And every time I switch through them, I'm like, oh Lord, why did I buy so many? Right. I don't know what color to use. I feel like you made your job harder. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I did the same thing with brushes. May okay. I say. Yeah. Well, part of it is like you have to go broad and make a mess before you can kind of pick what your favorites right. are. I have like every, every brush that Kyle Webster ever made. But right. I don't know. He's a good. He's a good. <laughs> he's a really good. Like he gets to have fun making them all, but everyone else has to right. choose from them, which is which is <laughs> like for me, it creates a lot of anxiety. Like, but I can't imagine having like thousands of different color palettes. For me, it's like no, too many options. Like, if you can just choose a small range of colors that that work most of the time, uh, and your client, most clients actually don't have a color palette ready for you. Just use your go-to color palette, unless you really like, like, if colors are your thing, and you like to change it up all the time, then that's fine. I don't. I, I love color, but I don't like getting stuck on options. So I have something that I know works, and it works, I, and I like the colors. Like, I, re, I genuinely like how they work, and I have found, this is a, definitely a tangent, but I've found that um, even when I've tried to vary colors over my body of work, there's always ones that I return to. So I was like, what if I just took the colors I always use and just use them all the time? So that was it. Yeah. Do you do the same thing with brushes? I did. Yes. So, um, I actually, before having a purely digital, um, process, I, I used a lot more, like I would use Photoshop for like putting things together and for adding color. But any of my textures, any line work, anything organic looking, I did by hand using black ink on paper. And then I would scan that in and I had a way of digitizing it and making it, adding color and stuff like that. And for me, that was a nice constraint. Like I only add these more organic handmade elements uh, through this simple ink on paper, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> uh, then one one day I get my my um, iPad, and then that sort of like, for me I'd always tr I had a, a really kind of on off relationship with my Wacom tablet, and so that's why I never really did much digital brushing. Once I got my iPad, I could use it kind of like a Cintiq, like I was able to use AstroPad, and uh, that's just, that just allows you to connect your iPad to your Mac and use it as basically a, a screen based tablet. And so that that changed everything for me. Finally, I was able to control the digital brushes I had Kyle's brushes, particularly. And so 
yeah, I guess I'm in terms of, yeah, first it's just like trying all the different brushes and finding none of them feel right, real to me. And then mm-hmm. kind of just finding a few that kind of do what I need. And then over time, just saying, okay, this, like I have maybe, maybe 10 at most brushes that I ever use fewer if possible. Most jobs are even smaller than that. And, and I just find that you don't need many, t- at least in the kind of work that I do, the fewer, the better, because it makes your work more consistent. You're not always changing your brushes. All your work's going to have the same quality. As long as you like the brushes and they work for the style you want, why, why choose new brushes? Like I, I kind of just blind myself to anything new. Like once things work, uh, I'll learn about them later if I need to. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. You know, there's a, after every episode, there's an action episode and it's going to be on there that we all have to pick like 10, 20 brushes. Not 20, maximum. 10 or less. <laughs> 10. Do you like the way I tried to double it? No, don't. You got to just choose. Well, everyone, you know, it depends on the, like, I think like, um, yeah, it just depends on the, the style of illustration you're doing. Mine's very flat. I don't need a lot of nuances. I don't need a lot of blenders and different size gouache i don't i don't even know uh, like Mm. yeah so yeah so it might depend a little bit but nonetheless you don't need a thousand brushes like i've got you don't need no think about think about like i i think a lot a a problem with a lot of newer illustrators i include myself in this is that we're not as classically trained as illustrators of some distant golden age were uh where they actually learned to paint first like really learn to paint mm. where they learned about the mm. underpainting, you'd, you know, mm. paint in with the yellow or, and then build up and model it and go from general to, I, I went to art school. I knew a little bit about this, but I never actually did it. So <laughs> the, the point being is, um, you really needed just like one big wash brush. And then a few, like you had your, your, your few brushes that you could even afford because real art media is actually really expensive. And you'd have like your few colors that you could afford because that's like, especially in art school. Um, and you get good at just using your limited ar- arrangement or your a limited set. And that's the same thing with digital. You really just only need these digital just because they're out there, just because it's digital and anything's possible. It doesn't mean you need to go and use all that. I mean, yeah, that's just my own take on things. Yeah, it makes sense actually. I used to paint trees just for fun, not real Painting trees. trees they is were very, not fun. <laughs> well, they were they were fun for me, yes. but they're really like a bit out there and kind of you know weird and wacky. Yeah. And but what I used to do, and the reason I'm telling you this story is, I would actually decide this is this one's going to have like red, purple, and orange. And then I would go and I would buy red, purple, and orange and some glitter because they all had glitter oh, on my course, trees. Yeah. And that would be it. I would like be constrained by making using those three colors and different, maybe a bit of like I would pick maybe one texture brush and that's all I was allowed yeah. to use. And it kind of made sense. But when I've gone digital, I've gone the opposite approach. I'm like the more, more, the better, isn't it? Like having a banquet, but you know, you make that point so succinctly to just refine down to the things that truly mm-hmm allow you to speak through your work consistently and repeatedly yeah yeah Yeah. i mean i i can only speak from my own perspective i know other people are different have different temperaments but the the plethora of options afforded by digital make me anxious uh (laughs) and and i always thought that i was a little just like a little bit nuts like just a broken human because of that tendency basically but uh there's this book and and i experienced this this sort of anxiety of options when i was a designer and we'd have to present dozens of options to our clients and go through hundreds of options just internally before we arrived at anything through consensus and it drove me crazy because i was just like it looks good it works like just pick that one and and like but i couldn't i couldn't i couldn't act on that that what i thought was the way it should things should be done because I was, you know, an employee as part of this agency. And, uh, that was the last, that was the last time I was ever employed in fact. But, um, at, at that point I was like, I need to be on my own because like, it's not that I, it's not that I know what things are, should be right away. But, but when it comes to options, 
like, I don't want to present that many to a client. I'm not doing anyone any um, help by by showing them all these different things and they have to decide. And and so I had this, I started building up this, this sense that like there's something wrong with presenting too many options. You need to show some options, but not this many. There's a book, this is where I'm going. There's a book called The Paradox of Choice. And I I can't remember the guy's name. Might, might be Barry Schwartzman. I could be very wrong about that. Um, but yeah, the paradox of choice, he basically says that more choice actually creates more anxiety. And, mm. and one of his big points is that when you have too many options, the thing that you end up choosing, you are not as satisfied with it, uh, as you could have been if you didn't have too many, cause you'll always regret the things you didn't choose. Right. And so I was like, this, this is my person. Like, like I, 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 I kind of latch onto that and I use that philosophy both in my, you know, small P philosophy. I use that approach in my own work, uh, in my teaching and also, um, to my clients. Like I want to, I consider myself to be the, like this, sorry, this, does, this sounds like I'm being like hoity toity or something, but like. I'm paid to be the creative expert. Yeah. That's my job. So if, 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 uh, someone who's, uh, in marketing, they're not creating stuff. They're more about like, how are we going to sell these things? They're coming to me for my creative expertise. I don't want to come and back to them and give them 16 sketches and be like, which one do you like? Cause then they have to do all that mental processing about which is the right decision. I like to come and say, these are three right decisions. You choose the one, like we, let's see which one's the most appropriate. So, yeah, that's... that's really fantastic advice, really, really strong advice. And again, it shows that confidence that you have in, in yourself. I mean, obviously you've worked first as a designer and then as an illustrator for how many years? Did I ask you that? Uh, how many years? Well, I guess I had my first proper design job in 09. Uh, and I went into illustration in like freelance full time. 2013 so yeah so that's you know you, you, you're getting up there i'm sure you've done your 10,000 hours i've, Tick. I've, I've put yeah. at least 10,000 hours <laughs> it doesn't feel like a long time like i feel like 10 years ago isn't 11 years ago 12 years ago maybe uh it doesn't feel like that long like it's kind of blown by and there have been people who are in it way longer right but mm. yeah i i i mean it's long enough uh, to have definitely gone through a lot of, uh, learning for sure. Yeah. You have this amazing quote. I'm going to quote it out to you and I didn't okay. warn you about this at all. So <laughs> here's the quote. It's not what you can draw. It's what you can't. That's the key to your illustration style. Mm -hmm. It's not what you can draw. It's what you can't. That's the key to your illustration style. Can you talk a bit to that? Cause I love that quote. Yeah, totally. Um, so obviously that's supposed to be a little provocative, but I really think that, I think I said that in the context of like when you're between drawing from reference and then drawing from your imagination. So, yeah. um, you know, I, in my, uh, one of my classes is called drawing toward illustration. And this class was, uh, born from this struggle that a lot of illustrators myself included have of like you have this sketch and you love how the sketch looks and you try to turn it into a proper illustration with all your techniques or whatever it doesn't quite have that that vitality that you that was promised by the sketch and and so my whole point in that class is those are two different things there's drawing and there's illustration those are not the same thing and um getting good at um, you, you kind of bring your drawing more toward your illustration style and techniques and you bring your illustration techniques closer in to the way you draw and s somewhere in that middle is, um, where you, you seamlessly have a, a, a way of sketching out your ideas and then you execute on them and you build on them. Um, but within that is this sense of, um, what you can't draw. So these in the same class, I have this idea of these two drawing modes. So there's drawing from observation, which I call O mode drawing. And then I have, 
um, drawing from imagination or, or your ideas. I call this ideational mode or I mode. And I'm kind of riffing on, I don't know if you know the book, Drawing from the Right Side of the Brain by Betty Edwards. I have that book. So it's a fantastic book. And I, if anyone wants to learn how to draw, that's the only book you need to start with. But, and that, and by that, I mean like classically draw, or like, um, you know, draw from observation. And so in O mode, um, you can draw from references, you can draw from life, you can draw from something that you're seeing with your eyes. Really, all you're doing is tracing with with some degree of skill or whatever, like you're tracing what you're seeing. And there is skill in that, but there's no imagination in that. And there's, um, and then I always encourage people to put their references away and then draw from memory. So maybe I, I drew my coffee mug that's sitting on the table here. And I, you know, I, drew, I may have drawn it well or bad, but whatever, I put it away. And then I try and draw what that mug is from, from memory. And then you, for, you may have forgotten what angle the handle was uh, attached, or you don't, you don't like draw in three dimensions enough to know even how to place that in your drawing. But there's something unique about what you're drawing there. In that, in that moment, uh, this is the longest ever answer to any question, but- But it's a good answer, <laughs> it's such a good answer. Keep going, keep going. That, the, the quirks in that, is your is like a huge part of your style now another probably what i didn't express in that is that it there's also an element of experience and maybe even of your your curatorial sense your taste in like you know this is a naive drawing but is it like something i can um present as myself is this something i want to keep drawing i think if it's repeatable and you've you've mastered the, you you that way of drawing from memory imperfectly then that could be a very big clue to your style so i was blown away when i watched that video i watched that video this week and i was like whoa <laughs> this is like a like just different advice like i've not had a different hmm. another teacher tell me that now i haven't studied with every teacher that exists on the planet mm -hmm. but i have like studied a variety to try to get a kind of feel for all sorts of different things and that just made sense to me and also as i was watching that and listening to you it reminded me of how my children used to draw okay. growing up that is actually my kids anyway. I know if other kids in the world are like this, but both of mine used to do exactly that. They would look around and try to draw the thing that, you know, the butterfly, they would draw the butterfly over and over, draw the butterfly. And then they throw the paper away and they'd get another piece of paper and they draw their own version of a butterfly. And it was, there was something so unique. Mm. Uh, so as I was listening to you, it somehow reminded me of somehow in the core of our childness you know a child self maybe that's very comes very naturally to us hmm. to do it that way i don't know where you got that from but that's what it felt like as i was listening to you i think i was just trying to make myself feel better about my bad drawings but <laughs> <laughs> no not at all no because you're right though it it captures something uniquely you because you've your brain will have captured and your hands almost like that you know, I do martial arts and in martial arts, we have that muscle memory. Mm -hmm. Muscle memory would be in drawing as well. Totally. It's like you capture an element of muscle memory, mm -hmm. but in martial arts, you practice over and over and over again. And like when someone surprise attacks you, you make up some weird combination of everything you've ever learned. Yeah. But that's what gives you your unique style. You know, when you go to kill a person, we don't kill anybody in martial arts, but we, we do like to pretend that we do. It feels like that. It's kind of like first you do it the way you're sort of supposed to, mm. not, you know, like you said, tracing. Yeah. And then see what comes out of you. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's probably, yeah. I've never thought of that in direct analogy between like martial arts and like drawing. But yeah, I, I think, I think it's just like you, you, you're drawing and from observation, you're, you're just kind of like, not in creative mode you're just kind of observing and then it's by drawing in that way that you actually have moves when you're drawing from your imagination suddenly you're you you you, you have forms and lines 
in your head available to use in your ideas. And it may not be very direct and it might not be like exactly as you saw it in the observation. It was, you know, it's not like exactly like you do in your kata or whatever, but it's like you have something more than you would if you didn't do that, that those, those, um, basics like the drawing. Do you still use that technique even now or have you gotten to a level where you don't ever have to draw observationally again? Right. Yeah. My, my ideal has always been like one day I just don't want to have to draw from reference images. I just want to be able to like be given a giant wall and and draw on it and out comes like, but that's my goal. But it, it, it's, it still isn't like that. Like I, I still have to look at, I save myself a lot of scrambling and, and time just by going through a bit of drawing. And I, and I think it's just like anything, it's a warm up. It gets you, it gets you going, it gets your hand moving, uh, without having to do, um, the higher level task of also thinking about your composition and stuff like that. So I'm not sure I'll ever truly be over drawing in that, like those two modes first the first the one and then the other like I think I always have to I think it's just natural it just for me at least it, it helps but I definitely rely on them less and I, I can get away with drawing an ent- or doing an entire illustration job without using references but it it really depends on its complexity and often I, I like it's more of a sure thing if I do that go through that stage that first stage yeah like you're doing a lot of kind of Viking stuff. Is that right at the moment? Is that for a project you're working on? Viking stuff. Um, just trying to think, what am I doing right Did now? Did I say it? Was it the wrong? No, I'm sure it was. It was like Viking type illustrations that I, I saw on your Instagram a few weeks ago. Quite a few. Maybe it was a little while ago. Might have been a was while ago. Was it not Vikings? I did have, I did like have like a, an opera singer that I had done for I, I saw that. GQ I France. saw that. And then I've been, so, I've been doing, um, I just finished a castle like a medieval yeah, that's castle. what I'm thinking of. Yeah, it looks a bit, a bit Viking, like sure. the castle, the medieval castle. There were that's Vikings around then at that time. There that's were funny. Vikings. <laughs> it's because my daughter was looking at him and she was like, "Oh, this guy really likes drawing Vikings," and I, I said, "I'm sure it's a job that he's working on. He's not the only thing he ever draws." That's really <laughs> but funny. Yeah, that was her, uh, be more her observation. What I draw and put on Instagram, but no, not at all. It was because you were working on that on that project, but. Like something like that, would you therefore, because you might not, you might think, oh, what does a castle look like these days? You'd have to still go and look oh, at a man. reference. So that, yeah. So that's for an entire kid's book called The Castle the King Built. And uh-huh. that's with the uh, National Trust, which is the, the the British like national parks kind of, they, they take care of all the castles and like lots of other parks and stuff in England. And so anyway, it had to be kind of rooted in fact. And so they came to me because they wanted it to be like in, a, in basically my style, but I had to, I had like stacks of books, like, uh, yeah, I did a lot of, a lot of drawing observationally. Definitely, definitely had to draw a lot of castles and, and stuff. I even went on YouTube and watched like historic videos of people like building castles and like replica castles and I would like pause the frame and draw so I did a lot of that there was definitely Mm. probably 20 I'd say 30 to 40 percent of the job was just referencing things that eventually became stuff that I could just draw from yeah massive Mm -hmm. have you ever had a situation where you've gone back to the client and said here's the thing and they've gone "Mm, nah don't like it or do you not run into that because they already know your style now i've definitely uh th- thankfully uh i've avoided that um and and that's an, a huge other reason why style is important um and there's more to that i mean that question just there's a whole avalanche of information about to come down but um i'll, I'll try and keep it snappy um a huge part of my process and something I increasingly want to kind of impart in my classes is uh, a process that I, that I kind of follow from start to finish that ensures you don't get that. Like, like first thing is you want to be approached or hired by people who know what you do. Right. 
you need to have a thing that they hire you for. That's how you're going to get your work anyway. And then you need to be able to deliver on what they expect from you. And so a huge part of that is just in setting yourself up in that sense, having, and that comes with experience. So you have to have enough work to show that you, this is what you do over and over again. But that's just one part. Another part is, is, um, staging, including the client in the sketches in such a way that by the time you're doing finals, there's almost no question of what it's going to look like. Like you'll surprise them with how well you do it, hopefully, right? My goal is always to like take that sketch and not surprise them at all in the concept, composition, or content. Everything is there in the sketch. Um, and then once, obviously you want to blow them away and just like how color and texture and all that kind of like breathe life into it. Right. That's, that's like, my skill as an illustrator, but, but by the time I get there, the client should have very little, like I, yeah, the, the client should have very little they can argue with at that point. Um, they might have, uh, small details. Like often I'll get things about like, so everyone has like their little things that they want. Like, Oh, can you change the, like just today I, I had a, a piece and, and I had put, uh, like, it's like, like, it's just like a street with storefronts and I just put lettering on what said cafe and they wanted to make sure that the E on cafe had like a little accent on it. I was like, okay, like, but there's always something like that, but, but that's just such a small thing. It's just kind of like not a problem, right? That's the ideal. It's like, you want to just, most things like, like I said, thankfully get past and I don't, I don't get that. And it's because I've been very deliberate about setting up a process that makes sure those questions are taken care of early in the process. Or I don't like, even before that, I can say no to a client that I know that's going to happen to. Like I can spot it and I just don't even go there. Yeah, that makes some, that makes really good sense. And again, really valuable advice for people who want to eventually illustrate for other people. I personally don't. I just want to bring my own characters to life one day. So yeah. that might be a double-edged sword because trying to make me as the client happy could be even harder yeah. <laughs> because I'm like, that's not good enough. Go back, get better I, at I, doing that. That's not <laughs> what I thought it was going to look like, you know? Yeah, I wouldn't get anything done in, in that case. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, let's talk a little bit about pain points pain points because you know I've got here from you it says it takes guts to be original and it is one of the pain points originality mm -hmm. as well as confidence and consistency so you know whatever whatever you feel like saying on on any or all of those but, uh, okay so pain points is just like I use that you can tell me if I'm if I'm kind of misinterpreting your question but pain points for me is just like a a compact word that I like term that I use to de describe the things that we illustrators really struggle. And we get stuck on like having a style. We get stuck on making our drawings match up with our illustration style. We get stuck on yep. how we draw people. How do we draw noses? How do we draw hands? Uh, maybe a pain point is drawing full scenes. Like, like so a lot of people will say like, I can draw like one thing, but I can't illustrate like a whole scene with like a, you know, and so those are, are what I would call pain points. And like within that, what's, what was the question? How do people overcome those pain points? Particularly for me, the confidence. I mean, I guess confidence would come with consistency and originality perhaps and time. Mm -hmm. But when you do get stuck on those things, do you then go, oh, well, I'll just stick to these bits that I'm good at? Mm. Or do you push yourself to do the hard things? How, how do you approach that? Yeah. Um, sometimes I, 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 I mean, especially like looking back, I mean, the reason I, I know, like I, I'm able to name all these pain points is because these were my pain points. And a lot of them I've just, I've been able to work out through a, a lot through just having consistent style or uh, through like I was just describing in my process that I take clients through where I lead them through the creative process. Um, 
I th- I think in in anything that I encounter as like the sticking point where I get stuck, there is a lot of um, there's dark moments in the process where where you you do feel lost and you feel like this is never going to come together. And, and so I think in those, in those moments, you're either going to give up or you're going to just push through. So that's like, maybe one thing is like, if you're under the gun and you have a client expecting something by a certain deadline, you're probably just going to push through, even if it's crap, right? Make, you're going to make the deadline. You may, you may think it's awful and maybe, maybe it is crap. (laughs) Maybe he'll never get hired again. I don't know, but you have to, you have to do it. And so, um, I guess that's, that's tenacity. That's like, you just have to do it and find a way. And that's where, um, you might find that it's not the right career choice and it might be where your best ideas come from. And it might be the place where you're like all these insights were just forged in a crucible like they were just like of 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 pain and suffering and that's why i'm excited about a lot of the things that i teach because um they are like i actually don't want people to avoid those moments in their lives they won't you won't be a a good creative if, if if you don't encounter these struggles and pain points and it's um it's why there's so many like great podcasts and 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 YouTube channels and stuff like, like going through this, uh, asking these questions, cause we're all going through that. And I really think that having, I, I guess I'm, uh, there's so much in there, but I, I think with all, all these pain points, you, you, so there is that just element of struggling through it. Now I will say that they become easier when you know where they belong, when you can name a struggle and say, ah, oh, okay, this is the struggle that always happens at this point. And I know how I'm, I, I know it's going to be hard, but I know what this step is and what I'm focusing on in this. And so a lot of it is just breaking a problem, an illustration problem down into its parts. And that includes like the chronological order in which things are done. So you might, uh, I think as an, as a beginning illustrator, someone might go and start right to illustrator or right to Photoshop before sketching. And they'll they'll do a whole bunch of stuff and never like it. It's because they haven't truly like like learned how to sketch and plan for an illustration, but, but they don't know how to plan for an illustration because they don't know how they illustrate. So there's that whole like chicken and egg thing that's happening, um, but through some kind of process that's unique to them, they'll figure it out, and then and then they have this order in which things are done. And the more you do it, the more you know. Um, what what pains and struggles you're going to encounter along the way and you also build more confidence that you will get to the end such valuable points and you know it is ultimately getting good with your own pro- your own process you know it reminds me because one of my dearest friends is an artist but she actually paints on canvas and many years ago we used to have this discussion because i was learning how to write she was learning how to paint And we'd come together and I'd say, oh, you know, you're an artist. It's easy for you. (laughs) But us writers, you don't know how hard it is. I'm stuck. I'm stuck in that midpoint and I don't know how to get out. And she'd always be like, oh, how dare you? Do you know how hard it is to paint? And she would launch into, and anyway, now we both laugh and think back and go, you know what? It was actually really tough equally for both of us. There was just as many pain points Mm -hmm. because we hadn't yet learned how to get through those really difficult points, whether it was, as you say, in the drawing or the painting, or for me in the writing, you'd get stuck. Mm -hmm. And at that point of getting stuck, I'd either walk away for three weeks and do nothing, or eventually I'd have to come back and work out how to solve that problem. Yeah. You just said it so succinctly. Yeah, no, but you touch on a, actually a really important ingredient that I that I include in my process as well. Uh but I think it's it's highly overlooked is is the break that you take. Like um if like just simplifying it greatly, like to have like 
your your observational mode ske- sketching. Take a break after that before you start trying to come up with concepts because I don't know what happens in our brains, but something, you know, simmers up there. And, and then when you get to sketching out your ideas, um, it's usually better in my opinion. And then when you're done that, you, you may have come up with like 60 different iterations of sketches, take a break because when you come back, you'll have more objectivity you know, you, you have time and space away from it. You know, you're, you yourself are a slightly different person than you were the hour or day ago that you were sketching and you'll see things in a different light. And, and so that space and that, that break is also really important in, in the process. Yeah, you're right. I think that that's often overlooked too by a lot of people, uh, particularly again in the, cause I'm uh, an independent writer. There's a little bit of that the faster you write, the more money you make. Mm-hmm. So write fast, write every day, 3,000, 6,000, 10,000 words wow. a day. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, you know, there's days where I'm like, no, there's nothing to write. And it's very well known that, you know, a bit like in drawing, you should draw every day, you should write every day. Mm-hmm. But actually there's some days where not writing or not drawing, I find is very beneficial because as you say, something's going on in my subconscious brain that makes me feel a bit renewed and refreshed and new ideas come in when I do occasionally take that break. So is that just a bit of a balance between the, the everyday thing and the not everyday thing? Yeah, I think, I think it has to do with like you get in a groove and unless you allow yourself some space and time, you'll stay in that groove for better, for worse. Sometimes like I get in a creative groove and I need to stay in it and I can't stop or else I'll lose, I'll lose it. There's something that I'm, I've got. And if I, if I give up now, I might lose it forever. Like I understand that. But sometimes like, like I write, um, I've started a, a, a discipline of writing uh, every day, five days a week uh, for an hour or so in the mornings. And I'm in a groove. I, I have to write every day because I won't write at all. But then I take the weekend off and then I, I come back to it the next week. And I like to think that like, I get off whatever groove or rut that I might've gotten in the last week. And I could think of fresh things. Like it was just, I don't know. I, it's pretty, I don't know. There's, that's what weekends are, right? It's a break from work and it's built in. Yeah. So what are you writing? Am I allowed to ask? Sure. Um, absolutely. So I want to write a book about illustration for illustrators. And so it's going to be, I have, I, I'm too early in the process to give you the nice tidy elevator pitch about it, but it's, it's going to be like my elevator pitch right now is it's a book for illustrators that you could read on the bus. Like it's not, it's not a pictures, like super fancy book. Um, it might have pictures in it, but it's not, it's not all glossy and cool, but it's, um, something more like. I've, I don't know if you've ever read The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield or any of Austin I Kleon's have, book. I love that book. Oh, yes, I love all those books. They're right? my favorite. So, They're somewhere on my back shelf. So these are like <laughs> books that you could like, you could dip into. You might see yourself sitting on the bus going to work or whatever. Um, and just like being encouraged by that. There's some insights in there. So that's that's kind of what I think. Like, I'd like it to be about. Um, so that's that's what I'm in the process of doing right now. And... So along this way, I'm, I'm keeping a blog and trying to, it's like writing, showing those awkward stages by sharing what you're writing. Um, you know, if, if, if people are interested in checking that out, do you mind if I, uh, please, please, absolutely. It's, uh, my name, tomfroze.medium.com. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely like, it's easier to write when you write every day for sure. And just stuff comes out. So it's so exciting that you've, apart from obviously being so talented at design and illustration and speaking and teaching that you now are writing. Mm -hmm. So there's just sort of an expansion happening, almost like the creativity just keeps going. (laughs) What's going to be after that? It's going to be amazing. Well, I don't know. I feel like this writing and speaking are are like my denouement. It's like the, (laughs) The, the, the like last few chapters of, I don't know, that's a bit, 
maybe underselling what's happening, but I, so I'm, I'm 40 now and I, I've always imagined that as I kind of age as a human and as a creative, of course, I want to still be in the game and making and stuff, but I, I, I feel like a, an age appropriate, um, thing to slide into and, and transition into is, um, I guess what I would call like knowledge sharing or, you know, wisdom sharing. So, so, uh, that's certainly not, I, I don't want that to make it sound like I want to be a guru. I, I, uh, certainly would, I'm not, I'm not like, a Tony Robbins or, or something like that. Uh, and I don't want to be, I, it's more just like a lot of the creative people that I've admired, they've written a book or they speak on stages. And I don't think that I'm, I'm very, a very good speaker yet. Uh, I think I have more talent in writing than actual public speaking. Uh, but I would like to get better at that. But, um, yeah, I just feel like, I feel like it's, it's, it's just something that I was, I've always seen as part of my career trajectory is to, is to put everything I've learned in a book. And, and I've had the the good uh, blessing of, of, I mean, teaching on Skillshare has been, Skillshare has been one of the most amazing things to happen to me. And I, I kind of came into it reluctantly at first. I thought it was, I didn't know what it was, but I did it and it started turning out to be like, oh, people are like learning things that I'm teaching. They're listening and watching my videos. That's cool connecting with students and, and, uh, reading how, what I've taught helps them. It's been like this two way dialogue between students, their projects, their testimonials or the reviews, the comments that I get, uh, every week and me kind of stepping up to, um, in growing comfortable in that role and, and, and seeing how it's helping. And so I feel like being able to write a book, and hopefully like speak on more stages and interact with people more in, in a live sense. Um, yeah, I think, I think, I think something good can, can come out of that. Definitely. And it, it takes a lot of courage, doesn't it? To, to put your own take, view, perception, information, theories out into the world and think, Ooh, is any, is anybody going to like agree with this? Or are mm. they all going to be like, no, that's not the right way to, to draw or to do things. Or no, there's no such thing as style or style's not important. All those things. It takes quite a lot of courage, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, I think there's a quote, I'm going to butcher it, but it's something about, you know, so, some things take either courage or stupidity and, <laughs> Right. I'm sure I, I'm sure I, I can't remember the exact words, but I think, I think there's just a part of me that would do this even if I was bad at it. Like I would just have to do it. And cause like I started off not so good in terms of maybe not in teaching, but like, you know, creative, like in, and, uh, and yeah, teaching doesn't, make me feel as vulnerable maybe as, as you'd think. I think where I do feel vulnerable is not that what I'm teaching will be received. Like I, I, I'm, I'm thankful to say I have a fair degree of confidence that like when I'm teaching, like, um, I'm, I'm confident doing that. Like I, I enjoy it. Maybe that's, maybe that's a better word than confident. Like I just enjoy it. Um, but the thing that makes me feel more vulnerable is, is when I teach techniques that are kind of part of my own process. And I have this bit about, you know, how our job as creatives isn't to make this secret sauce, this one secret sauce that we safeguard and keep a secret forever. Because all it takes is for one person to find the recipe and then you're destroyed. And so our job isn't to create secret sauces. It's, it's like being a secret sauce factory where we make all kinds of different things and, and the, the power is in our creativity, not this one thing that we can do, um, or that we, and so I've encountered this in, uh, all my classes from inky illustrations to inky maps to odd bodies. Um, and I'm getting, and even in sweet spots, but like, I think I'm, 
I, I've just become comfortable with letting go of things that I think are my secret sauce. And I see people like copy and imitate what I do. And I give people permission to do that in my classes. But there are moments when I've been like, why am I doing this? Mm. Like people are like, um, I've seen a lot of work that looks like mine. Uh, and, and when I, when I really think about it, it it's in, it's, it's for me, it's like exciting and invigorating because it's like, Oh, okay. Well that doesn't define me anymore. I'm going to find a new thing that does. And so I think I, I'm, it keeps me going deeper and deeper in what is, what is mine. And mm. like even little things like this is something I, I haven't really talked about before, but like in odd bodies, I started seeing work everywhere that looked just like my work. And I started kind of like, there's, there's just this moment of feeling like I've lost something that's, that's mine. Right. Like, I'm not going to lie. Like there is that part of, um, and, and I want to emphasize that it was my choice to do that. And I knew that I, that would happen. But when I see it, sometimes it, it's like, oh, but, but it's caused me to like, just like refine my own work and, and to, to, to ever just even small tweaks. Like one of the things is like, I used to always do closed little like smiley eyes on all my people and the eyes were never open. And, and for me, that was for whatever reason, all I didn't want open eyes in my characters. And then I'm like, well, I guess I'm doing open eyes now. Like I want, I, I need to like do something different. Um, it's a little bit more me. And so now I'll, most of my eyes are now these googly eyes, which I used to hate and, and I'm, I'm loving it now. So like, I don't know if that's like a stylistic achievement, but it's, it's just, it's good. It's good to be able to adapt, and and by sharing what I make, it, it I'm challenging myself not to be. Um, it's not just technique that that makes me, you know, creative or original or whatever. Yeah, that's that's such great insight, and as you say, having taken that step and faced that vulnerability, and it is I I can totally relate as you were talking to my other life when I used to teach other. I used to actually teach myself, but it was in the field of, of health and healing and counseling, okay. totally different, yeah. very similar experience. When I would teach my technique, I'm th I'd be thinking, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. But you're, you really nailed it because as you do, you, you elevate somehow your own, your own technique. And I, I think you just said that so, so poignantly, it's an awkward word to say really, but you, you really did say that so well. And hey, f flattery, if people are loving your style and they're wanting to, to learn some of that technique, then, but there's only ever one Tom Froze, we know that. So, <laughs> you know, if it's an original, you know, there's a lot of people that might copy Monet or any of the other famous, you know, past artists, but there's only one them, right? So mm -hmm. I think it's just really, really generous of you to teach the techniques that you do. And it, it was just great to discuss it with you, to be quite honest. Well, we've run out of time. We've gone a little bit over time, but I could talk to you all day, Tom, because you are just a fountain of knowledge. In the show notes will be all the links and to a few things that you mentioned, including I'll put in there the Astro Pad, I think that's what you said, mm -hmm. to for people. And your blog, of course, your website, People can check out your Skillshare classes, jump on and do them. They are so good. You will transform as an artist. I promise you that. I hope that everyone's learned a heap. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, yeah, I think you ask great questions. <laughs> Thank you. You give great answers. What a team. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks. thanks so much, Ellen. Did you find that interview valuable? Great! Now be an awesome human and go and leave a review because it helps the podcast out so much. Want to read the show notes? Check out thechildrensbookauthorpodcast.com Want to find out more about me, Eleanor Page? Find me at eleanorpage.com or come and say hello on social at Eleanor Page Books. Until next time... Keep writing and keep learning.